You've got to know when to hold it, know when to fold it, know when to walk away, know when to run. That's our topic for today. G'day, I'm Paul Clark, Lead Minister at Redcliffe Uniting. Thanks for joining us as we continue our journey through Mark chapter 1. I'd encourage you to like, share and of course donate to our ministry through our website. But most of all, dive in deep with God. And if you need our help doing that, drop us an email. Flo was a young lass who felt the call of God on her life. She wanted to serve God by serving others. So she became a nurse and was soon serving in some of the worst situations around. She listened, learned and used her brain to improve the positions of her patients. She was an outstanding nurse, loved for her compassion. Then one day she left the hands-on day-to-day nursing of patients to take up an admin role. Some thought it was such a waste. Why would such a talented and dedicated nurse go into administration, management? Last week, we launched our yearly theme, Enlarge Your Tent. You can find the message on our YouTube channel. This week, we're considering our theme leading up to Easter, cross-eyed. And we're doing that very intentionally. Whatever we do this year, build a building, start groups, witness to the world, serve and give, if our faith is not defined by the cross of Christ, if we are not cross-eyed, it is in vain. This is to remind us that we are servants of the risen, crucified one. He defines how we serve. So we take up the story where we left it. Jesus has taught with authority in the synagogue, backed by a spiritual authority casting out demons. Now the group of disciples go home to Simon's house. Notice we meet Simon's mother-in-law. This is Simon of Simon Peter fame. He was married. Did you know that? We never hear anything about the marriage. Anyway, Simon's mother-in-law is in bed sick. Sickness was much more fearful in those days. People could die just like that from fever. So they were keen to introduce Jesus to the situation. I mean, they had been seeing such amazing things. Jesus goes to her, takes her hand. What a, what a nice little detail and helps her up. Her healing is so complete, she is able to go and do what would have been her delight, serve them. Jesus restored her to her purpose. Mark tells this story so matter-of-factly. He doesn't explain or embellish, it just is. He doesn't describe the feelings, reactions or emotion. Jesus just heals her. But can you imagine it? It would have been surreal. Is it really happening? And you can hear all the talk that would have gone out from that building. We know this created sensation. In Mark's gospel, this healing is only his second miracle. But after sunset, the whole town gathered at their door, all the sick and tormented. It was either after the sunset on the Sabbath, and so now people could come out, or this was about their shame. In the dark, all their hidden and unclean things could be revealed. Cynthia told us that in Sri Lanka, most families would hide their disabled children. Jesus's was a similar culture, how sad. Yet tonight, the whole town came out. What hidden thing do you have for Jesus today? And so Jesus heals many. The Greek word is polis, where we get polygon, many and abundance. It's not quite all. The Bible doesn't say he healed all, but who knows? Either way, Jesus has a field day. 
He heals so many and he drives out demons. He drove out the things that tormented people, the tormentors and dementors. And he commanded them to be quiet. Jesus doesn't want their muck messing this up. What torments you today? And at some point, it obviously finished. Because the next thing we know, Jesus is up early to pray. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm one of the disciples, I know we've made it. We've found this guy who can heal people like that. Maybe Judas is thinking about the money they're going to make. Maybe Simon is thinking about the army they're going to raise. Maybe Philip is thinking about the people they're going to help. And maybe John is thinking about the, the church they're going to build. But when they rise in the morning, their prize fighter, their talent, their star, he's nowhere to be found. And the crowd is already building. We've got to find him. Where could he be? Hang on a sec. Jesus is always getting up early and going off to pray. I know where he'll be. So they follow Simon and they find Jesus mid-prayer alone on a hill. For someone so smart, Jesus, you're pretty dumb. This isn't how you build a revolution. This isn't how you, you build a brand. Everyone wants a piece of you. Let's go, Jesus. And Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, completely flummoxes them as he says, let's go somewhere else, to one of the small villages, so I can broadcast my message there also. This is why I have come. It must have been a, a powerful, powerful object lesson. Jesus walking away from the crowd. A hurting crowd. A hungry crowd. He walks away from the easy, the immediate, because of a bigger purpose. This is one of those readings that can trip you up the first time you hear it. Hang on a second, did, did Jesus just bypass sick, dying, hurting people for preaching? What's going on? I thought Jesus loved people, had compassion on people. Of course he does. But sometimes to help many, you have to bypass a few. To save thousands, some may need to die. You have to know when to chase the bigger goal. You have to know when to sacrifice the good for the godly. Jesus knew that the most important thing was to proclaim the gospel to many, not to get bogged down in good, very good, but not eternal healing. This is the task and challenge of leadership, parenting, teaching, to know the greater good. The girl in the story at the start was Florence Nightingale. She became a nurse back when nursing was not a glorified profession, but the job you took if you couldn't be a house servant, scullery maid or washerwoman. Basically, you were paid by the sick to clean up after them, bedpans, blood and vomit, often till they died. It was a thankless, horrible, and dangerous job. Not really about medicine at all in those days. Florence, contrary to all convention of the day, had been educated by her father. She studied medicine, was intuitive, and worked out that things like hygiene, hand washing, ventilation, sanitation made a difference. She cared and her patients got better. Now, Florence could have been the most wonderful nurse of four or five patients at a time, beloved of her community, saving hundreds in her lifetime. But Florence saw more. She heard the voice of God. From her writing, she wrote, God called me in the morning and asked me, would I do good for him alone without reputation? She became an administrator, a matron, she ran field hospitals in the Crimean War. Under flow, death rates went from 50 to 2%. 50% to 2%. One in two soldiers to, to two in a hundred dying. 
She trained nurses and petitioned parliament. She agitated and administrated. She set up a training hospital for nurses in England that is still the best in the UK to this day. She quite literally wrote the first ever textbook on nursing and is considered the founder of modern nursing. Her Lady of the Lamp legend turned nursing from a job for the destitute into a job of prestige. Her work on sanitation in India saved millions, billions, who knows how many people's lives she saved. It is estimated her efforts alone increased life expectancy at the time by 20 years. Wow. Flo could have been the best little nurse in her village, saving hundreds, but she worked hard rubbed people and practices up the wrong way and changed the world. To do the second, she had to walk away from the first. Jesus could have been the best little rabbi Capernaum had ever known. With the biggest synagogue full of healthy disciples and queues of people waiting to see him. Or he could save the world. That was Jesus' choice today. To do the second, he had to walk away from the first to save all for eternity he had to neglect some for a time now at first you might be inspired by this message but then you might start thinking hang on a, a moment don't we need day-to-day -day nurses and i was only ever a teacher i i, I was never a principal I want to say to you, people like Flo are exceptional. Most of us will never be like her. Being a teacher, cleaner, nurse is really important. What did we say during COVID? We didn't need sporting stars, but we did need checkout operators, nurses and cleaners. But I think we all need to ask ourselves, God, how do you want me to serve you in this job or this situation I find myself? Is this the most important thing you have for me at the moment? Oh Lord, is there more? Because God wants both. He wants the mother-in-law who serves at table and the divine son who goes to the cross. So how do we know? How do we know what to do, whether to have a job or volunteer, whether to be a parent or a professional, whether to, to stay in my role or progress. What did Jesus do in this reading? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus asked his dad. That's why it's not a formula. I can't tell you, you must do this, you must do that. No, it's personal. Everyone is unique. It comes from your relationship with God. Now, sometimes you might pray and not get an answer. Who's been there? And sometimes the answer isn't words or directions. It's doors opening and closing. Sometimes it's just trust. Lord, direct me and then see where God takes you. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart. And if you can live in the gaze of God as you do it, then that is all joy. We could rest as a church, go about our usual business, but we asked, Lord, look what you've given us, land, resources, people, neighbours. What's next for us? And God has taken us down the path he's taken us. He's opened door after door. Has it been easy? No way. Like Florence, we've had to work, push. But what will God do with where we get to? Jesus knew that his temporal healing of people, his casting out of demons, would mean little if he never went to the cross. We would all still be lost in our sins. Demons, death and disease 
would have had the last laugh. Jesus had to go to the cross. His ministry had to be bigger than physical healing. He had to preach loud. He had to preach wide. His message and his method had to arrive at Golgotha so we wouldn't. So we could experience true and lasting healing. That's a challenge for us because we like healing and we like the immediate. We love the idea of miracles. Often we see it as the end game. If only God would move like that, it would be good. But we wouldn't find it was everything. A friend I knew went to the hospital to pray for a stranger who was sick. They went in, told him who they were, and that they believed that Jesus could heal them. And they began to pray. And miraculously, to the amazement of all, the man was healed over a number of days of prayer. When it came time to be checked out of hospital, the man met with my praying friends. He shook their hands. He looked them in the eye and said, thank you. And he went back to his old life without a passing thought of God or Christianity. Jesus knew there were bigger plans afoot. He was cross-eyed. I pray that we might pay attention to God's bigger plans, trust in those bigger plans, especially when the smaller ones fall through. Ask ourselves, not do I need a promotion? No, but how does the gospel call me to do what I'm doing? How does the gospel call me to be a parent, a retiree, a policeman, a nurse? How does the cross change what I do? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus' one-eyed uh, chasing of that purpose. In the immediate, it can seem like he doesn't care. He's forgetting us. But he chases the bigger goals because his care is bigger than our immediate wants, but rather our eternal needs. Oh, Lord, what a, a lesson for us. What a challenge for us as individuals, as a church, as families, as community, to chase the greater good. Lord, what are the things that torment us today? What are the things that we are ashamed of today that we can bring to you for you to bring not just temporary healing, but wholeness to our life. And Lord, I pray that we won't get um, grumpy if you don't heal the immediate. My aching elbow, my sore knee, my mental health issues. Lord, unfortunately, the news of the gospel is to live in eternity we are going to have to die our physical death. So I pray that you'll be with us as our bodies age, as uh, our bodies start disintegrating. Help us to know these are the signs of the cocoon coming off and the eternal life being revealed in us. Oh, Lord, may we hold on to that hope. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.